want to start off by asking you a question and just kind of get you to contemplate it for just a second. Do you think it's wrong to ask God questions? Okay, you go ahead and contemplate that quietly to yourself. <laughs> Guess we didn't left out that part of it. I don't think it is either. And, and the reason why I don't is because I think that we learn the most when we're asking questions. That's why when little kids are, are young, they ask questions nonstop. Uh, before I was married, my oldest nephew uh, was about three at the time, and I was riding in a car with his dad, my brother-in-law, Joey, and we were going to the store, and the, the Nathan was sitting in the back seat and was nonstop talking. He's like making play-by-play -play comments, asking questions. Dad, where are we going? When are we going to get there? How long is Uncle Richie going to stay with us? On and on. And while this is happening, I'm trying to have a conversation with his dad. And, and so I'm trying to talk to him, and Joey's talking fine, but there's something inside of my brain that kind of went tilt, you know, as because I am hearing him talk so much, and I'm hearing Joey talk, and I'm kind of going, uh, 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 uh. And finally, I looked at Joey, and I said, you can't hear him, do, can you? <laughs> and, and he said, what? And I said, you can't hear your son in the back seat talking, can you? And he went, he kind of grinned from ear to ear and goes, no, I guess I can't. That's why I'm able to have this conversation with you. And, and it made me think that that's kind of how we think God is sometimes. We think that we're talking, we're talking, we're talking, we're asking questions, we're trying to figure things out, and it seems like he's not really listening to us. And, and I want to let you know today that he is listening to you. He, he does know what you're walking through. He's not absent. He, he's not uh, aloof in any of our lives. He knows exactly what you're dealing with. And he's actually given you a manual called the Word of God that you can actually go to to find every one of life's questions being answered in his word. It may not tell you specifically like who you need to marry, but I'm telling you, the word of God will reveal to you who you need to marry. Uh, when I was dating, I've shared this story before, but when I was dating Pam and we were about ready to get married, I was freaked out. I was 27 years old. I'd waited to get married. I wanted to make sure I was marrying the right person. One day I'm reading in the word of God that he who finds a wife finds what, a good, what is good and receives favor from the Lord. I'd read that passage many times, but it leaped out at me and God said, Pam's the one. Now, again, her name did not pop up there in the word of God. She, she kind of likes to think that it did, but it actually <laughs> was just God speaking to me. Because every question that you and I have is found in the word of God. The, the challenge is, is we don't actually want to really seek the answer. We just want God to give us the answer. And it's kind of how we want him to move in our lives in a lot of ways, honestly. We want him just to make us get out of bed in the morning and have a quiet time. Grab us by the ear. All right, you're going to get up and we're going to read the word of God today. You know, that's kind of what we want. And, and so we, we get this issue of challenges of trying to figure out, God, I know that you're, you're promises are in the word of God, but I don't know where to start. Thank God for Google. Honestly, you, you type in that. Thank God for small groups. Thank God for Christian brothers and sisters in the Lord that we can go to and we can sit around and start having some conversations about some things that we're trying to understand because I don't think it's wrong to ask God questions. In, in fact, in Isaiah 1, 16, the word of God says this, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. I don't think God is afraid of any question that you would ever ask him. Here's the challenge. There's a difference in asking God questions and questioning God. Because when I'm reading the word of God or I'm going through something and I'm trying to understand, I'm asking God, God, I don't understand this passage. God, I don't really understand what I'm going through. What do, what do I need to do different? And that's a good question to ask. But that's different than questioning God. Hey, God, do you know what's going on down here? Hello, God, have you forgotten about me? Now, I don't think God's going to be freaked out even if we are questioning him, but we start putting ourselves on a path that we start heading in the wrong direction. Because the moment I start saying, God, I don't know if you really love me, God, I don't know if you really know what's going on, I start allowing doubt, fear, and unbelief to start coming into my life. So I, I want to ask God questions, but I don't want to be questioning God. So it's okay, God, help me understand what I'm going through versus God, do you know what I'm going through? So it's why we're doing this series that we all have questions because, honestly, every one of us have questions. Oh, yeah. we, we continually have questions in our lives. And a question that I get asked a lot, the question that I want to start off the series with and tackle today because I get asked by Christians and non-Christian is, why would a loving God allow pain 
and suffering. And, and I think we all wondered that from time to time. And maybe you've gotten established on this, but most people, it takes a while for them to get there. Because I think that we get confused from time to time with pain and suffering. Because it seems diametrically opposed to the fact that God is a loving God. We've got pain and suffering and God is loving. And so it's easy in the midst of our pain and suffering to wonder, why would a loving God allow pain and suffering? God, why would you do this? And for many people that find themselves in the midst of pain and suffering, those are the moments that they're likely to give up on God. They'll, they'll walk away from God and they'll, they'll say, well, if God, this is the way life's going to be and God's supposed to be loving, I, I don't know if I want to have anything to do with God. That's why it's so important for us as followers of Jesus Christ to become incredibly established on who God actually is. That we know who God is. To know beyond any shadow of a doubt that God cares about our pain. That, that our sorrows still move him. That he loves you and I with an unconditional love. Because it's the story of God in human history. is the story of God proactively and actively engaging with you and I. Because he loves us. He, he loves you and I deeply. He's got this incredible, again, love for us. That God is love and that God loves, it has to be the framework that we have to begin with. If we're going to dive into this issue of why is there suffering and pain, we've got to begin with the understanding that God is love. If we're going to make it actually work in our lives, we've, we've got to believe it. So the focus of our conversation today and my talk with you is about pain and suffering is why does God allow it? first of all, and why does it happen? Why does God allow it and why does it happen? And I think it comes from at least two different sources that I can think of. So let's deal with the first place that it typically comes from because it's the easiest for us to deal with. I, I have people tell me that they can't believe that there actually is a God because if there's a God, why does he allow us to suffer like we do? So let's just say for argument's sake that there is no God. Is there still suffering in the world we live in? Yes, sir. Yeah. There is. Even if there is no God, there's still pain and suffering in the world that you and I live in. But wait, if we say that there is no God, then we have no one to blame. Right? right? We now have to take responsibility, at least in part, for some of the suffering that you and I deal with. Because so much of human suffering, I believe the biggest portion of it is self-inflicted. It really, it's, it's, it's either self-inflicted or it's inflicted upon us by someone else. That's where most suffering comes from. But most of the time, we want to blame God, which, by the way, is why we need to change our mind and decide that there actually is a God, yeah. right? Because if he doesn't exist, then we have no one to blame for our suffering. That we actually cause suffering on ourselves and on other people. But we're great blame shifters, aren't we? I mean, we really, I mean, isn't that one of the great benefits of being married <laughs> or of having children that we have someone else to blame, yeah. right? That's what employers are for. Yes, Listen, we blame them because we can't get ahead in life. Right. Or we blame the government. Right. We blame the church. Right. We blame a pastor. Yeah. We blame our community. Right. We blame our children. We blame everyone. We blame a teacher that we had in school and that's the way I am today. Listen, it's easy for you and I to shift blame to someone and something else. Right. It, it is. It's, it's so easy for us to blame other people for our suffering when so much pain is actually self-inflicted. Right. Stuff that we've done to ourselves. In fact, yeah. there, mankind has always acted this way. Yeah. We, we really have. In fact, in the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, when Adam ate of the fruit that he wasn't supposed to eat of, right. what did he say? Yeah. Look at it here in Genesis 3, 12. Yeah. Then the man said, Adam said, the woman you put here with me, yeah. she gave me some fruit from the tree, and so I ate it. Right. Adam's not responsible for what happened, right? right. It, it's, it's God's fault. Yeah. Right. It's the woman's fault. Do you realize in one statement, Adam blamed both God and the woman for what he had done wrong? Yeah. And it's that in, in our lives today. In fact, you know what? What's the sad thing is it's not only in our lives, but it actually continues with our children when they see us doing that. It's what we see in the Word of God because in Genesis chapter 4, there's a conversation with God between, going on between God and Cain. And Adam, he, Adam is the son of Cain, and Cain has a brother named Abel. 
And they're having this conversation. Cain and Abel both brought forth their offering to God. And Abel brought forth an offering that God had required, but Cain didn't. See, Cain wanted to do it his own way. How often do we do that in our lives? We want to do it our own way and ask God to bless what it is that we're doing. Rather than to find out from his word what he's blessing and start doing that. He wanted to do it his own way. So God didn't accept his offering. And look at it here in in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must master it. God is warning Cain. He's helping him to see that there is something being formed in his soul that is dark and destructive. So God told Cain that he had better get control of this or he's going to end up doing something that he's going to regret. But Cain doesn't listen. And so, honestly, it's no different than us today. Listen, we, we don't listen to the word of God. We may hear it with our ears, but we don't, we don't listen and obey what the word of God says. And we don't realize it, but dark and destructive thoughts begin to develop in our soul. And, and the thing about it is, is that when they begin to develop, you don't see the fruit of it immediately. But six months down the road, suddenly you're walking out of the marriage. Six months down the road, suddenly you're dealing with depression and all kinds of anxiety and you have a joyless life simply because you did not obey what the Word of God had asked you to do. If you think I'm going to be stepping on your toes all day, you're exactly right. So buckle up today. So Cain doesn't listen. So they go out into a field and while out in the field, Cain kills his brother Abel. Self-inflicted suffering. Brother against brother. Human against human, friend against friend. So Cain kills his brother because he's angry with God. So he kills the one that God loves. So God asked Cain a question in verse 9 where he says this, Where is your brother Abel? And just so you know, every time God asks you a question, he's not really looking for an answer. He actually already knows the answer. He already knows the answer to it. So where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Just in case you've ever wondered the answer to that question, the answer is yes. You and I, we actually are our brother's keeper. We were not created to hurt one another, to destroy one another, to devour one another. We were not created to do that. We were created to love one another. We were created to care for each other. And then the Lord says in verse 10 something that is both amazing and frightening when he says this, what you have done, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. There, there's a whole lot of suffering in this world, but it's not because God doesn't care. It, it's not because he's indifferent towards us and he's just kind of letting us fight like kids. And it's not because God doesn't exist or because he's not involved, but it's because you and I keep hurting each other. So you might think, if we're the cause of all this hurt and suffering and pain, why doesn't God just stop us from doing it? Why doesn't he just stop? See, what happens is that we want freedom of choice. We just don't want to have to live with the consequences of our choices, do we? We don't. And listen, if you're looking at a reason to get mad at God, get mad at God because he didn't make you a puppet. That he didn't make you a robot. Time to worship me. Get mad at him for that. Listen, because he gave us a right to choose, and we're probably not responsible enough to actually choose. Listen, we can't get mad at God because he created us to be thinking and creative beings who often make destructive choices in our life. And I want to pause just from my message here just to say, it's why we're talking to you all the time about your next step. Because, listen, you will not go from... Being angry, hurtful, damaging other people to instantly just being right, but you can take your next step. Right. It's pretty interesting. My, my granddaughter, Bonnie, is learning how to walk, and it's the cutest thing right now because she, she walks with her hands kind of like this, and she walks like this <laughs> as she's walking. And it, it's honestly, it's funny because she's just learning to walk, and that's how it feels when you start changing behavior. Right. When, you, when you're used to just being ugly towards people all the time, or you're used to being critical or a gossip, whatever it is, and suddenly you start changing, it feels like this because you want to say things. You do. The thing we talk about at my house is we call it the filter. 
And man, you, sometimes you got to double up the filter. You got to ratchet down the filter. And rather than saying that thing, and it feels like you're doing this, pretty soon you'll kind of start going. And suddenly you know it, kind words are going to flow out of your mouth. Loving words are going to flow out of your mouth. But we just want to change instantly because we're an instant na- generation and an instant nation. We want self-gratification of being totally, able, being totally able to fix everything instantly. So, so we gotta, we got to step back. we got to recognize God wants to do a work in his life. And listen, I'm sorry for those of you that have had to suffer the consequences of other people's destructive choices. And honestly, we're all in this group at some level. Some of you, it's, it's catastrophic what's happened in your life. Some of it's just, just damaging. But listen, I'm, I'm sorry that you bear in your life the scars of those that hurt you. But listen, we don't have to allow those scars to be the thing that defines us. You and I have a choice. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. We can start thinking differently today. What we need to do is allow God to heal us and then allow the way that God heals us to be the thing that defines us. So instead of it being, I'm just ugly towards you because of what happened in my past, I want to tell you how God healed me of what happened in my past. The thing that we go through is the thing that enables us to minister to people who are going through something similar. How I like to say it is our misery, the thing we walk through, becomes our ministry. When you go through something, whether it's a divorce, uh, uh, an abusive situation, and you get healed from it, you can step into people that are dealing with divorce or people that are dealing with abusive situations and you can speak life to them. Yes, amen. And I've had questions about the hurts and wrongs that are done to people and how that, that people that hurt them, it seems like they, they kind of get off scot-free from the consequences of the thing that happened. And so people ask when, when they, it seems like they're getting off scot-free, where's the justice in that? Where, where's the justice in the fact that they got away with that? And, and it's interesting to me because for our wrong actions, right. our, our hurtful decisions that we make and the choices that we make, Preach. we want mercy. Right. And, and we want grace. Right. But for others' wrong actions, their hurtful and destructive choices, yeah. we want justice. Yeah. See, so much of suffering is because of us. Right. It is. And, and I guess God could wipe us out. Right? I mean, if, if just start all over again, I mean, isn't that what would happen if God just operated in justice? I mean, I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but, you know, I'm not getting what I deserve. Man, I'm glad I don't get what I deserve. Honestly, because what would happen is there would be a lightning bolt coming out of heaven, and there would be some ashes sitting down here if I got what I deserve. But I'm thankful that Jesus paid the price for me. And I'm thankful that he, he is a God of justice, but I'm thankful today that he's a God of grace and mercy. I mean, you know, God, I mean, if you just think, if God could just start all over again, I think he tried that once, didn't he? (laughs) Genesis chapter 6, let's look at that. It says, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was on only evil all the time. And the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Notice that it's not God causing us pain. It's that we're causing God pain. God's heart was filled with pain. And in verse 7 it says, So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. We experience so much suffering that is self-inflicted because we don't choose to live by God's plan. We, we don't choose to follow the purposes and the plans of God. We choose not to love, and we choose not to care. Yeah. Well, Pastor Richie, I don't feel it. Your feelings have nothing to do with love. Right. Love the feeling is a product of love the verb. Right. Yeah. So if you're married or in a relationship with somebody and you're being a little unloving towards them, you need to get in alignment with what God's asking you to do and start loving people and caring for people and watch how you change and watch when you change how it changes everybody around you. It's powerful. That's what God's asked us to do. We don't choose to live the life that God created us to live. And so we're envious, we're jealous, we're bitter, we're angry, we're violent, we're self-centered, we're narcissistic. When I hit you, just say amen. I was saying amen to all of them, by the way. And this is the moment 
where God in human history looks at it and says, enough is enough. Yeah. I'm grieved that I've made man. But I'm so glad that verse 8 is there yeah. because it says this, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That one guy is the reason why you and I are here. Right. Listen, verse 9 goes on to say, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. And I love the way that it says it here. It says, blameless among the people of his time. Not perfect, but listen, doing better than anyone else because he walked with God. Yeah. Listen, in our walk with God, it's not about perfection, but it's about a continual walk with God. It's about not giving up when we fail. It's about not giving up when we feel like God lets us down. Yeah. So you know the story. Noah builds an ark. God sends a flood. And then, then the flood goes away. Jump over to Genesis 8, verse 20, and it says this. And then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again. Will I curse the ground because of man? Even though every inclination in his heart is evil from childhood, and, the, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So the first reason why we suffer is because it's self-inflicted, either by us or by others. And honestly, we've got to take responsibility for that. We, we've got to start saying, I want to be the best version of myself that I can be. I want to be a better version of myself than I was last month. I haven't arrived. I'm on the journey, but I want to be better than I was last month. And then there's this other place where suffering comes from where we have natural disasters. Things like earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, hurricanes, wildfires that we recently experienced here. Children that are born with terminal diseases. Young people who are healthy one day and the next day discover that they have cancer. Accidents, plagues, different things that happen. And we wonder, why does God allow this kind of suffering? Because it always seems so random, doesn't it? It, it seems like you were at the wrong place at the wrong time. You were in the wrong city when the tornado hit. You were on the wrong road when you were hit by a drunk driver. And, and so we, we try to understand, if God is loving, why is there pain and suffering? Well, in order for us to understand this aspect of it, again, we've got to go back to the Word of God. I hope you'll see this as a theme throughout the series that all, we always have to go back to the Word of God to understand. And so, because long before Lion's King Circle of Life, yeah. you all remember that story? The circle of Life, right? You all remember that? Yeah. All right. God has been telling us that everything is interconnected in our lives. That everything's connected. That every choice, every action has a significant complex reaction to it. Everything does. Everything that is happening in our world or being done to our world has a cause and effect upon the world, the planet, if you will, in which we live in. So the person who says, I'm not hurting anyone but myself, that's a person that does not realize just how much they're hurting everyone else. It's like the alcoholic or the drug addict that doesn't realize the devastation to their spouse. The destruction that's happening with their children, that they're literally breeding a generation of addicts. Yes, it's the abusive person, the person that is either physically or verbally abusive that doesn't realize that children are watching. Right. And those children are actually going to grow up to become verbally and physically abusive themselves. Yeah. See, how can you and I ever think that any action that we take is disconnected from the rest of humanity? Right. It's not. In fact, it's actually much bigger than just humanity. Humanity's actions in the world actually affect the created universe that you and I live in. Yeah. That everything is interconnected. It's what the scripture tells us. It's what the word of God tells us. It tells us that when we chose to live our lives apart from the creator of the universe, when man severed his relationship with the creator of the universe, the entire universe, the world, again, our, our globe, yeah. our planet went into disarray. And it has been groaning and agonizing ever since. In fact, we see it in Romans chapter 8. Paul the Apostle is writing this and explaining this. He says, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. In other words, all creation is waiting for God to restore humanity to himself. Why? Because everything that God made was broken. Everything that God made was shattered when sin entered into the world. It began to decay. 
It began to die. In fact, verse 21 says it this way, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. These bodies that are decaying, one day our bodies are going to be redeemed. And they're no longer going to decay. Listen, sometimes we are so unaware of what is going on around us, we just can't seem to see the mess our lives are in. And maybe it's because we're better than our parents or we're better than we were, but we don't recognize the mess so God helped us by creating creation. He, he created as, as beautiful and wonderful and majestic. There was majesty everywhere that you go. So that all, de- all creation would declare the extraordinary God that you and I serve. Amen. So that we would be drawn to him. Because, but because of the fallen condition that you and I live in, God has allowed creation to go into disarray. When sin entered into the world, it began to affect creation. So the now creation groans and agonizes so that we could see that humanity, in our humanity, the, the creation, the pain we are actually causing to creation. Is, is this making sense? I'm not saying it really well. But because of our fallen nature, now we've affected all of creation. And it's interesting, but people process pain differently. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that? Some of you have an incredibly high tolerance of pain. And because of that, something can become broken, and you can live with it for a long time, but because you don't recognize the pain, often things don't heal right. And the reason that you can live with pain is for some reason, the pain doesn't properly register with your brain. And so what happens is you end up more broken from it. And most people in this category think that they're really tough. But honestly, most of the time, it's just your body doesn't process pain right. And by the way, that can be physically and it can be emotionally, yeah. where we're, we're tough. You, you don't understand the abusive home that I grew up in, so man, hey, bring it on. Right. I got this, and we don't recognize that we're, we're mashing stuff down, we're mashing stuff down, we're mashing stuff down. We're broken on the inside, and God says, I want to heal your pain, but we don't even recognize the pain. Right. That is on one extreme. The other extreme is some of your hypochondriacs. Right. Just the thought of having pain sends you into a tailspin of pain. And you're pretty sure now you're going to die from the pain that you're feeling right now. Every time you have a pain, oh, this is the big one. I know I'm going now. Listen, when we suffer with pain, it is the pain that is letting us know that something is not right. That something is broken on the inside. But you know what we do in our lives? It's like we're driving our car and the check engine light comes on. You know what we do? We put a piece of duct tape over the top of that. That took care of that. And we do that in our lives. We just put a piece of little duct tape over it and we just keep going, not realizing the damage that we've had happening on the inside of our lives. All creation is in pain. And it is the agonizing chaos of creation is one of the ways that God lets us see the condition of the human spirit. To understand what's happening in our world. So as I wind up today, I want to remind you, some some of our our suffering is self-inflicted, that we hurt each other and we're hurt by other people. The, the other is the result of creation being in chaos because of the separation that you and I have from God. And, and listen, I recognize it's hard for us to understand sometimes why bad things happen to good people. Why would a loving God cause and allow, not cause, but allow pain and suffering? But if we begin with the framework, if, if you and I will get it established in our lives that God is love, that he is love and that he does love, that God has been and always will be motivated by love, that God cares about our pain. He, he cares about our sorrow. He cares about our suffering. And again, we can ask, God, can you help me understand this? It causes us to rest in his goodness and grace. And that's the thing that empowers us to live a life of hope, even in the midst of pain and suffering. And so as I wind up the service today, I'm going to ask you just to stay seated for just a second, if you would. And I'm going to ask you just to bow your head and close your eyes because there's a few things that God has specifically put on my heart to pray over you today. And and I'll tell you, here's what you can do. You can just kind of let this moment go. Richie, I'm good. Everything's great. Or you can lean in and allow God to touch you today.
Because the first thing that I want to pray over you is for those of you, I, I want to pray healing over those of you that you have suffered at the hands of other people. Somebody has said something to you, somebody has done something to you, and it has negatively affected you for years. And as I'm saying it right now, that person's popping up in your mind, by the way. Or you're remembering a situation and God's speaking to your heart right now. God wants to heal it. God wants to touch it right now. So as her heads are bowed and her eyes are closed, if that's you going, Pastor Richie, that's me, I'm, I'm going to ask you, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I, I'm the only one looking. I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up, hold it up high for just a moment. Yeah, hands going up everywhere. Just keep them up for just a moment. This is really between you and God. I just want to know who, how many people I'm praying for today. Father, I pray for every person that has their hand up right now. God, that, that has been damaged and hurt by somebody. And I pray right now for healing to flow into their lives right now. God, that you would touch them. Lord, that the, the thing that they walked through, the thing that they dealt with, the thing that has attached itself to them, Lord, that today they would begin their healing. God, that they would be set free. God, that they would forgive the person, that they would let go of that situation, that they would make a choice to say, God, I'm completely releasing that person right now. That they're going to choose to walk in forgiveness towards the pain or the thing that that person caused them to suffer with. So, Lord, I pray right now, let your Holy Spirit, Father, speak fresh life to them. God, bring healing, bring health, bring wholeness, and bring life. And, Lord, I pray today that you'd give them the courage that when they walk out of here today, God, as, as they begin to, to have maybe those feelings begin to come back, that they'll begin to release it again. That they'll begin to, to establish forgiveness in their heart for that person or for that thing that happened. So God, thank you for your healing power. Thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Thank you, God, for healing us. Second thing I want to pray is I want to pray for you to forgive yourself. Again, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Maybe you're here, you're going, man, I'm the one that hurt somebody. I'm, I'm the one that caused the pain. I'm the one that inflicted the pain upon somebody. Or maybe it's just a sin that you've committed against yourself and you're having a hard time forgiving yourself. I want to let you know today, God has forgiven you. It's okay to forgive yourself. So again, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if that's you going, Pastor Richie, I need to forgive myself today for something I did in my past, something that I did to me, to somebody else. I need, I need God's forgiveness. I want to receive God's forgiveness in my life. I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up and hold it up high also. Yes, yes, hands are going up again all over the place. Father, once again, I pray for every person that has their hands up. God, I pray right now, Father, that you would empower them to receive your forgiveness today. That you went to Calvary for us to pay for our sins. You have forgiven us, God. Help them to forgive themselves. Help them to, to let go of the past hurt, the thing that they said, the thing that they did. And today, God, receive your forgiveness and love. God, I pray right now that you administer the love and hope of Jesus Christ to them. God, that you'd speak words of life to them. And once again, God, as we leave this place today, through the coming days and weeks, Lord, that when the enemy tries to bring that back on them, they would continue to receive your forgiveness. They would continue to receive everything that you died to set them free from. So, Lord, I thank you, Lord, Father. Thank you, God, for forgiving us. Thank you for forgiving others. Lord, it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.